Hi, and thanks for being with us. This is our Bible class for Sunday, February the 7th. We're wrapping up our study of John's Gospel. We come to John chapter 21, which for those who study the scriptures from kind of an academic point of view has given them a little bit of trouble. Because if you remember, as we finished up John chapter 20, it really kind of finished everything up. John wrapped everything up. He said in verse 30 there, Truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. And that's a great way to just kind of wrap everything up. And so some folks have said, well, maybe chapter 21, and again, these are folks who come not from a perception of faith, or, or sometimes they do, but they just want to be sure. And they say, well, what if, you know, uh, chapter 21 wasn't part of what John originally wrote? And, and they said, what if chapter 20 is where it was supposed to end? They've asked those questions. I, I can tell you as they look at it and, and really decide on it, people of faith have all said, there's never any record of John's gospel having just these 20 chapters. This last chapter is always included in it. And while chapter 20 finishes that purpose of bringing about faith, you, you don't need to know anything else. Jesus' final appearance isn't designed to generate more faith. Instead, it's designed to legitimize the mission of the disciples. It, it shows that Jesus sends out the disciples. And all three of the other gospel accounts conclude that way as well. They tell the story of Jesus, but they always end with what Jesus said to the disciples. We think especially of the Great Commission in Matthew, but, but really all four gospel accounts want us to understand how the mission of Jesus is handed off to the disciples, which then on the day of Pentecost becomes the mission of the church. And so John 21 fits perfectly in with that idea that, that here is the commission of Jesus. And so while chapters 1 through 20 will lead you to faith, chapter 21 is what ties you in to the church. And so it's really an important part. Some have called it kind of an epilogue. The, the story of, of the life and ministry of Jesus really wraps up in chapter 20. And, and John's signs, he's given us those seven signs. They're all done. But chapter 21 just kind of ties up the last of the loose ends for us. One of those big loose ends is Peter. We last saw Peter denying Jesus. And so uh, we're going to get that taken care of. And again, we'll see that commission as well. Chapter 21 begins with, After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. So we see that, that here's a group of seven disciples that are all together. John's going to tell us this is Jesus' third appearance to the disciples. And we know it's some form of the group of disciples. The first time, remember, Judas was dead. Thomas wasn't with them. The second time, all of the 11 disciples still living were there. This time we get seven of them, but it says Jesus is going to show himself, or, or your Bible might say reveal himself at the Sea of Tiberias. That's another name for the Sea of Galilee. And so John wants us to, to see this revelation. And so he sets the scene. And we've seen John have an attention for detail. That's about to come up in a big way in just a moment. But he says, here we have Simon Peter. And that's John's way. Whenever Peter's been absent for a while, he always calls him Simon Peter the first time to kind of help identify exactly who we're talking about. Thomas called the twin or Didymus, which is how we saw Thomas recently named as well. Nathaniel of Cana. It's the first time we get Cana mentioned as Nathaniel's hometown, but this is Nathaniel. That's one of the disciples. The sons of Zebedee. That's James and John, or uh, Andrew and James. I'm sorry. The the sons of Zebedee. And, and so uh, I'm. That is James and John. So James and John are there as well, and then two other disciples. Traditionally, this is Philip and Andrew, but but we're not told that for sure. They're kind of linked elsewhere a little bit for us there. And so here you have these seven disciples. In verse 3, Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. Man, a lot of people have made a lot out of this. And certainly there's some discussion. Peter kind of takes the lead. He was probably the oldest of the disciples. Traditionally, he was. John was the youngest. And Peter here is with this group, and he says, I'm going fishing. And the six other disciples decide, hey, we're going to go with him. They said to him, we're going with you also. And they went out immediately, got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. So, you know, some folks have said, this is Peter saying, I quit, I give up, I'm going back to my old way of life. And that's certainly one way to look at it. 
We don't ever find Jesus condemning their choice to go fishing. They had been told, you know, Jesus showed up and then disappeared again. And certainly that must have caused a little bit of consternation for them. But, but they were waiting for him in Galilee. And so they go back. And in the meantime, they still need to eat. They, they still need to provide for themselves. And these are trained fishermen. They knew what to do to feed themselves. And so they said, hey, we're, we're going to go fishing. We know Matthew 28, Mark 16, Jesus had commanded them to go back to Galilee. And so while they're waiting for further instructions, Peter says, hey, I'm, I'm going fishing. It doesn't necessarily mean that he returned to his old way of life, but it simply means he knew what to do in that moment. And let, let's go catch some fish. We can sell those fish. We can eat those fish. So Peter said, I'm going fishing. And they said, we'll go with you. And they got out in the boat. And that night they caught nothing. Nighttime was the best time for fishing. These were professional fishermen. They knew that. They went out at the best time using the best of the methods to the best of their abilities, and they caught absolutely nothing. And so verse 4 says, But when the morning had now come, they fished all night. Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. We've seen this several times where when Jesus shows up, he's still Jesus, and at some point they realize this is the same Jesus that was with us. But he's also different enough that they aren't immediately certain. We saw it with Mary Magdalene. We saw it with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And here his disciples, they, they don't see it. Perhaps it's because of the distance from the boat to shore. And there at sunrise, they can tell somebody's there. Perhaps it is some kind of divine thing where he's hidden from them. But Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples didn't know it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? And they answered him, no. No. Jesus frames that question in a way that expects a negative answer. He seemed to know that they didn't have that they hadn't caught anything. He asks them, he calls them children. And the word there is a unique word that's used as he describes that. Instead of the more common word for children, here he calls them uh, he calls them paideia. Paideia can mean like guys, friends, technia is the word for children that's usually used. But here he says, hey guys, did you catch anything? Again, this might be that, that language that just they, they still weren't sure who this stranger was on the shore giving them advice. He says, guys, do you have any food? Children, do you have any food? And they answered him, no, they hadn't caught anything. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Whether Jesus shows some kind of supernatural knowledge here, it's odd that the disciples would trust a stranger to give them fishing advice. Maybe after a night of frustration, they were ready to try anything. Maybe after all the lessons they'd learned with Jesus, they said, hey, when a stranger gives you advice after a bad night, you should follow it. Or perhaps they said, you know what, from where he is on shore, maybe he can see something that we can't. And so he said, cast that net over on the right side of the boat. And right here is distinguished from left, not distinguished from wrong. That's not what Jesus is saying. But, but he says, cast it over on the right side of the boat. They do. And, and the, the net is so full of fish. We're going to see later it's 153. They can't even draw it back in. And it's at that moment when the net is miraculously filled with fish. Nobody could explain that. That the light bulb begins to go off. Verse 7, therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. John has this realization. Only one person does this. It's the Lord. And, and in true fashion, John's kind of the first one to put it together. And now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he'd removed it and plunged into the sea. Peter had, had stripped down to his working clothes. They would have been on the boat. It was all guys there. So he was down to just basically an undergarment kind of thing. And, and that would have been that, that long garment they wore on the inside. And it says he puts on his outer garment. The word put on can also mean bind up. Uh, again, those function like a robe. You can imagine that wouldn't have made for easy swimming. So Peter tied it up, cinched it up. And, and then he jumps into the sea. He's going to swim back to shore. And the, the word there that's used for, for tying on or putting on his outer garment, it's the same word that's used in chapter 13 for Jesus tying a towel around his waist as he gets ready to uh, wash the disciples' feet. Uh, Peter says, I, I'm going to do something. Peter's a man of action. And so he jumps into the sea and, and he's going to swim back. It's about 100 yards there, uh, 200 cubits we'll see in the next one. He plunged into the sea, verse 8, but the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, about 200 cubits, dragging the net with the fish. So they come in and 
You know, last time we saw that they tried to, in Luke chapter uh, chapter 5, we saw that they were trying to pull that net on board. The boats began to sink. This time they leave the net in the water and, and they drag it in with them. And, and they drag the net in behind the boat. Verse 9 says, Then as soon as they'd come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. So they get to land and Peter's going to help pull that that in and we're going to see that here in just a minute. And they find that Jesus already has, he's had fish from somewhere, his own private supply. And he's cooking it over a fire of coals. By the way, that, that word is used only twice in the entire New Testament for an anthracia, a charcoal fire. Jesus is cooking over a fire. The only other time we've seen this fire was outside the house of the high priest as Peter gathered around one of those anthracia to warm himself where he had denied Jesus. It's the only two times those, that word shows up to describe this fire. Perhaps Jesus has intentionally set this up and, and it brings to mind where Peter last saw a charcoal fire like that. But Jesus has got fish and bread out. In verse 10, Jesus said, bring some of the fish which you've just caught. Contribute something to this meal, he says. So verse 11, Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. There's a lot in this verse. We learned Peter must have been a pretty strong fellow. Here the, the other six guys are having trouble with the net, but Peter goes and he drags it up. So Peter was a big fellow, a strong fellow. And the net is full of fish, full of good fish, 153. And some folks ha have tried to say that, oh, there was... You know, there's some significance to the number 153, and they've tried to find it all kinds of different crazy ways. I think John is writing the story, and he knows fishermen care about how big the fish were, were and how much you caught. And so he says, hey, we caught a bunch of big fish. We caught 153 large fish. I think he's just given the report. It shows it was an eyewitness. If there's any symbolism connected with the 153, it's never made clear. You can tell that just by reading all the people who think there's some symbolism. They all disagree with each other. So, so John says there's 153 fish, and he points out that although there were so many, the net was not broken. Uh, part of that, that miracle of the catch was that the net held even such a large amount, more than it was designed to do. And then verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Jesus invites them to, to come and to eat and in the first century, they typically ate two meals a day. This would have been that first meal of the day. Jesus says, come eat with me. Interesting thing there at the end of verse 12, John says, yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. This is an attitude we haven't seen from the disciples before. There'd been a familiarity with Jesus, a camaraderie with Jesus, but, but that seems to have slipped by them now. They knew that it was Jesus, and yet there is almost a fear there. None of them dared to ask. That's an odd way to express how they felt. And yet there must have been something in the appearance of Jesus. As much as he was Jesus and they knew he was Jesus, he was also different. This is Jesus post-resurrection. There, there must have been a, a glorification about him that was somehow obvious, and, and we don't know how. But, but somehow it was obvious in such a way that it caused them, there was a, a reverence now, a, a respect that while he was Jesus, their friend, Jesus, their teacher and their master, he was also Jesus, the Son of God. And so they treat him just a little different. None of them even asked, who are you? Verse 13, Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them. And likewise, the fish. Maybe they remembered the meals of bread and fish, the miraculous meals they had eaten at Jesus' hands. Regardless, here he goes and he feeds them. And John tells us in verse 14, this is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. There are those three appearances, and they only refer to the twelve. Paul's going to talk about several appearances to lots of people, but John focuses in on three times when Jesus appeared to the disciples. The first time there in the upper room, Thomas is gone. The second time there in the upper room when Thomas is back. And now this third time, even though there's only seven of them here. But Jesus has shown himself. He was manifested. He, he appeared to them following his resurrection. And so as you look at all of this, there's some really interesting notes that I think we can make, you know. Peter had had kind of, you know, there was a big climactic moment. The tomb was empty. Peter and John race out to it. Peter goes in. They've met with Jesus. They'd had all the things and that surrounded the resurrection and those appearances right then. And 
Now they're in Galilee and Jesus is gone right now. He's disappeared again. And, and so Peter says, let's go fishing. In essence, Peter, I think, is just saying, let's go back to work. Let's get back to what we know, back to the practice and the trade that all of them knew so well. It was fishing. And while some describe that as an act of apostasy, I, I think that's a, a pretty harsh judgment because Jesus doesn't condemn them for it. I think they wanted to do something positive with their time. I think they also were looking toward, hey, we're going to have to provide for ourselves again. And fishing is how we know to earn money. And then it says, when morning came, their nets were empty. Just like how they started out. They fished all night and they caught nothing. And, and we can imagine how they must have felt after everything that had happened, after all they'd been through. And now they fish all night long and catch absolutely nothing. Not a single fish. They were tired. They were frustrated. They might have been a little bit touchy with each other, a, a little bit short. They, they were probably a little bit baffled. You know, how come we, we know how to fish? This is a bad night. And they were hungry. They planned on catching their breakfast. They caught nothing. And just in those little words, we can identify with that, right? It describes the futility of work sometimes. Ecclesiastes says that sometimes work feels like a striving after the wind, just trying to catch the wind. And you can't do that. They worked hard. They worked well. And through no fault of their own, they achieved nothing. It happens that way sometimes. You know, we find all kinds of different uh, incidents in our life. Maybe you work really hard on an assignment and, and you work and, and there's a computer error and it's lost. And, and you know how, how it feels to work hard and to achieve nothing. You, you clean and you clean and you clean only to have the kids come along after you and all of a sudden it's a mess again. You, you work hard for a, a promotion or a contract and at the last minute it gets given to someone else. You worked hard, but you achieved nothing. That's that futility of work. It feels like our time and our money and our energy was all wasted. And that must be how they felt. So much so that they took that advice from a complete stranger. But as soon as the net is filled, they realize this is the risen Lord. This is Jesus. You know, Christians who work in business and this, this idea of a secular job. I love what Jesus is saying here. You know, sometimes people look at me in ministry and say, oh, well, you get to work for the Lord. You do church work all day, every day. And I am blessed to be able to do what I do. And I love what I get to do. But sometimes folks who, who clock in and, and work at, at a factory job, who, who go and, and head out into the field to work, who go and drive a truck to, to work, they, they feel like, oh, well, I don't have a churchy job. And the word for that is a secular job. Jesus takes a look at these men who were fishing. It was a secular job. And, and they worked in their business. And, and there's some encouragement here in the fact that Jesus makes himself known in their work. Jesus doesn't criticize their going back to their old occupation. In fact, in fact, he brings success to their working endeavors. That's a neat idea. I think for many of us, we ought to incorporate that idea because the story raises the question for us of whether we look for Jesus in our work, whether we expect Jesus to show up in our secular work. Do we expect that in our, our secular work, in our day-to-day -day work, our, our complex, even often difficult situations, that Jesus would fill our nets to the bursting like he did these fishermen? That, that, you know, just like there's moments of incredible futility at work when everything seems to go wrong, there's also moments of exciting transformation when lots of great things are happening and we get to be in the middle of it. Do we expect Jesus to show up in our work? And there's a balance there. Being a Christian doesn't mean, hey, my work is always going to succeed. Hey, being a Christian means the net's always full of fish. There's certainly those times of frustration. And having Jesus there on the shore talking to us doesn't guarantee that everything works out just right. The Christian faith is not that kind of an insurance policy. But in Christ, there's a scope for transformation. There's a way of looking. And Jesus simply gives them some advice. Throw your nets over on the right side. As Christians, are we looking for those similar words of wisdom? Maybe from Jesus himself as our study of scripture, it informs sometimes even the decisions we make at work. But I, I really like the idea that Jesus partners with the disciples in their fishing business. 
even as he asks them to partner with him in being fishers of men. Jesus partners with them. He provides that piece of, of advice, of wisdom. Certainly they understand that he had something to do with the miraculous catch of fish as well. And, and Jesus, as they come to shore, Jesus has already been busy cooking breakfast for them. They are working together at their secular work. Do we have an idea that Jesus works with us in our job? And do we have an idea that the fact that the risen Lord takes part in our day-to-day lives can transform everything that we touch? I love that picture here. Next week, we'll we'll wrap up and we'll look at Jesus restoring Peter. Such a, a beautiful picture. And we'll go ahead and take a look at the conclusion of John's gospel as well. But I hope this week you just take away this idea of Jesus partnering with us in our work. And maybe that can help us as we go about our day-to-day activities as well. Let's pray as we close. God, you're good to us. You bless us in so many ways. And Lord, you have given us every spiritual blessing. But today we're reminded that you also bless us in our work. I pray for everyone watching this video that that we will understand that you go with us in our day-to-day lives that everything we do can be touched by your presence and transformed by your love and grace in our lives. I pray for students that they'll understand that you go with them to their test, to their work, with their classmates, to school. I pray for for all those who, who punch a clock, that they'll see Jesus coming with them to work. I pray that we'll all have eyes open to see the opportunities that come to us each day because you are with us. Thank you for the promise of your presence. Thank you that you work with us that you are on our side in all of this. Guide us and go with us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.